So what I'm doing here is I've pulled up Abacus so that we can have a quick discussion. It's really, it really makes no sense to talk about these relationships unless we look at what they mean and what they do to the overall behavior. So what I'm doing here is I've set up, taken that simplest model that we had started off with, the elastic model, and of course the aspect ratio is incorrect. When you do it, you have the correct aspect ratio, right? So I have just flipped the aspect ratio so I could look at it a little bit better. And then this is the part, you've all already done this, this is something that you're very familiar with. And previously you had defined an elastic material with the, prop, with the name referred to as steel. And so what we're going to do now is change it into an elastic, perfectly plastic material. And in order to do that, all I'm going to do is edit it. These are the steps that you will do in your homework. When I assign homework number three, these are the same things that you will do. And I'll have you do all the five models that I talked about at the end of the previous class. All right? So here I'm looking at an elastic material behavior. Now that we are looking at this in class, rather than me making a video at home, we can talk a little bit about some of these options. And, uh, there are lots and lots of options that are available. doesn't mean that you want to look at all of them. You want to only use the options that you are going to need. In this case, we had used the elastic material. And as you can see, even the elastic material has several options, including hyperelasticity or hypoelasticity and so on. None of those we are using in this class. When you get to plasticity, there's quite a few models that are available for you. There is uh, plasticity with a cap, cast iron, clay plasticity, concrete damage plasticity. We won't talk about that at all, but that's available. Concrete smear cracking. We're just going to go with the first one, which is just the plastic material. And as soon as I click on it, it adds to the material definition a little tab that says plastic. And it's asking me, what kind of hardening do I want? Of course, there are options that are available. I don't need any of them because it's a plastic, perfectly plastic material. So I can leave it just the way it is. It's asking me if the material is strain rate dependent. We won't need to specify any of these information. You use temperature dependent data when you're doing analysis at elevated temperatures like fire. You use strain rate dependent data when you're doing analysis for impact or blast. Right now, we're doing none of those. So all we're going to do is specify the yield stress. And look at what it's asking from you. It's asking from you the yield stress versus the plastic strain. And if you look at the Abacus uh, user manual, it'll tell you that it wants the true strain versus plastic strain, the, the curve that you just generated. Now, although I told you that I don't want to give each and every data point, I could copy the actual physical data of true stress versus plastic strain and stick it in there for next set. It'll take all that. It'd make it cumbersome. Uh, internally, Abacus might still choose to fit a multilinear approximation of the same data, but uh, you can also idealize it like I asked you to do in that homework, and you'll have a better model because you may have measured data for one coupon, but what you really need is an idealized data because even the coupon data varies with location, with orientation, so you really want some sort of an idealized model that you can use for your investigations. So you specify the yield stress of 50 KSI, and this is the part where in order to make a perfectly plastic material, you actually specify nothing for the plastic strain, or you can write a value of zero. And once you do that, it becomes a perfectly plastic material. If you specify additional values of the plastic strain, it would become a hardening material. It would go with isotropic hardening. So, so we'll do that after we're done with the discussion of the practical models in the field. Where are we right now? We have looked at the yield surface. We have understood that steel is a J2 material, which means that its yield criterion depends completely upon J2, which is the second invariant of the stress tensor, of the Dewey-Tonic stress tensor. And we've looked at the flow rule. We've identified that the flow rule consists of identifying the incremental plastic strain as you go forward. And that seems to be in the direction of the gradient to the yield surface. And its magnitude is given by D lambda. The Direction word refers to the relative ratios of the plastic strains. Doesn't really talk about which direction the material is stretching. Okay, so those are the things that we've already looked at. We've now defined an elastic, perfectly plastic material. At this point, I can dismiss it. I can go back to the assembly. Everything else stays the same. I'll go back to the step. And I just want to make sure that we have figured out or we've put in the right parameters. This is the first step. The nonlinear geometry is equal to off, and we'll talk a little bit later about what that means. Uh, click OK. Dismiss out of there. And now, I'll go to the load. 
Now, we had applied a shear traction that you can see on the screen right there. And this traction was equal to 1 KSI. I'm going to keep the uniform distribution, but this time I'm going to make the traction general. And now I have to define its direction. So I'll pick up my direction tool. It asks me, pick the first point of the direction vector that I'll pick is this one. The second point I'll pick is this one. <clears throat> and the magnitude of this stress, I'm going to apply 50.1 KSI. The traction is deformed per undeformed area, is defined per unit undeformed area, and the amplitude is that. What that means is, over that step, it gradually increases to 50.1. Let me make sure I check that. There we go. That's the simple loading case that I've applied. I've applied a uniaxial stress of 50.1 KSI because I made this point earlier in class that when you're talking about a, about a perfectly plastic material that yields at 50 KSI, you can't really do the analysis for 50.1. And I want to make sure that the uh, model is doing what I expect it to do. The mesh already exists. I don't need to revisit that. All I need to do is create a new job. And what I'll do is I'll create a new job by the name of <clears throat> I'll call it in class so I remember I created this in class. It's asking me what are we doing here? I think I'll remember if I say that I applied fifty point one case. It's a full analysis. I'll go ahead and submit it. And it should run through in about a few minutes. Or a few seconds. So I'm now monitoring the analysis results. And it's telling me that it has started, it has completed the analysis input processing. It started out of the standard. And then it's telling me errors. It tells me time increment required is less than the minimum specified. Abacus standard analysis existed, exited with an error. Please see the message file for possible error messages if the file exists. All right. So it's also telling me that it took several increments in order to solve this problem. It started off with increment number one, which was 25% uh, of the load was applied in that first increment. And then it kept on increasing the force. The total force that was being applied was 90% of what had been specified. So this is telling you the total force that has been applied. 25%, 50%, 87.5%, 90%, 95%. It got up to about 99.75%, but it couldn't apply everything that it needed. It said the increment that I needed to take in order to apply this force became too small. The increment, the size of the increment was already 1 multiplied by 10 to the power minus 5. So if I look at the message file, where will I do that? I'll click on the message tab right there. I'll scroll all the way down, and it will tell me what happened. It says that there were 20 increments. I had an error, and the error was that the time, requ time increment required is less than the minimum specified. Now I could go back and reduce the size of the minimum time increment. I've given it 1 multiplied by 10 to the power minus 5, which means that it tries to apply the load in an increment that is 100,000th. So it took 50.1 KSI, divided it by 100,000, and tried to apply it. And it couldn't find convergence, because that last 0.1 KSI had nowhere to go. Right? You can't find an equilibrium state when you apply 50.1 KSI. So you could always go back and make that time increment 1 multiplied by 10 to the power minus 6. You can make it 1 multiplied by 10 to the power minus 10. That may be excessive. And you will just wait for 4 hours after which it come back and tell sorry, I can't find convergence. <laughs> Right. So it says that the force equilibrium was not achieved within thousands. The solution appears to be diverging. Convergence is judged in likely. Does that make sense to you? We talked about this. We told that it was going to crash and burn, and it did. So if I were to look at the results now, what do I expect to see? Okay. Now this is the last unconverged increment. And what it's telling me is that it's not being able to find equilibrium. I wonder what the value of U2 is going to be. Firstly, the stresses are 50 KSI to the extent possible. And it's giving me answers that don't make much sense. 
The magnitude of U2, it has stopped at about 0.5 or 0.47 inches. It tells me that I can't really apply the last increment and the analysis is going to move. In fact, if I look at my stresses, shows me that the value is primarily 50 KSI in all the elements. So what's going on at the bottom there? At the bottom there, I have a boundary condition that is not simple. I have a boundary condition that's a little bit more complex. What do I mean by that? At the bottom, that plate was specified as fixed. And what, what that means is that it can neither translate in one direction, nor can it translate in two directions. Not being able to translate in the two or the vertical direction, that makes sense. But when I constrain it from moving in direction number one, the material wants to have a Poisson effect, right? If you stretch it in one direction, it wants to have a Poisson strain in the lab in the transverse direction. But that transverse strain has been prevented from occurring by the boundary condition, which means that I get an edge effect. If I wanted to relieve this edge effect, what would I have to do? If I wanted to conduct a pure tension test, I would have to go back in and relieve U1. And once I relieve U1 on those nodes, the analysis will not even give you that stress concentration at the bottom. Instead, it will give you a state that just does not converge anywhere at all. All right. So that's where we looked at the results from analysis number one. And it helps us understand what's going on. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back. And I'm going to try and figure out how should I do this analysis for an elastic, perfectly plastic material. What I would really like to do is push it out to a strain of 0.01. So in order to do that, I'm going to do two things. First, I'm going to relieve that x-axis restraint. How do I do that? I'm going to go into the boundary condition that I have defined. I'm going to edit that. See, I had restrained u1, u2, and ur1, ur3, which uh, restrains in-plane rotation. All I have to do is relieve u1. And now I'm only restraining u2 and ur3. But if I don't restrain U1, what that means is that body is flying in the x direction. has no constraint, right? Nowhere does it say that U1 is equal to zero. So as far as the solution of the equations are concerned, U1 can take on any value because it's not been constrained. And the analysis will run through, and it will give you an answer. Because even I don't care if this body is flying away in space after being stretched. But it would be better and more sensible to provide a restraint at one node so that it's not flying away in space. And we'll do that. So what should I do in order to conduct this analysis? I mean, I applied 50.1 case. I really want to go to 1% strain. How should I do it? Yeah? Apply displacement. I should apply displacement. We talked about this the last time as well. If you try to apply a stress of 50 KSI, there is an indeterminate number of strains that correspond to it because it's an elastic, perfectly plastic material, all the stresses are 50 KSI, whereas the strains keep increasing. So if you apply a stress of 50 KSI, it doesn't know whether you want to be here, or here, or here, they're all 50 KSI. That makes it indeterminate. So you have to specify a value for the strain, and it will back calculate the equilibrium position. So in order to apply a strain of 0.01, what I'm going to do is apply a displacement. The length in the in this direction is 180 inches, and I wish to apply a strain of 0 0.0. How can I do that? I can create a boundary condition. In this case, it will be displacement. It will be applied in step number one. And I'll apply it right here at this set of numbers. That's it, that edge has been selected. I can click done, and I'll say that I want to apply a U2 equal to 1.8 inches. That should do it. I can click OK. And now I'm applying the loading in terms of this space control. Also, I was going to restrain at least one node so that it doesn't go flying off in the x direction. So I'm going to create another boundary condition. And this time it will be in the initial step because that is a boundary condition that's there from the beginning. <coughs> I'm going to select just this corner node. <coughs> I'm going to tell it, okay, you're not flying away in space. But that should do it. Later on, we'll see more sophisticated versions of this as we get into bi-action. 
So let's take a look at this. BC1, the first boundary condition specifies the initial boundary condition that the bottom edge is not being able to displace in the U2 direction. The second boundary condition says that in the first step, that top edge is going to displace by 1.8 inches. And the third boundary condition is just <coughs> the initial state, so it restrains the body from flying over the surface. I still have that load applied that I need to get rid of. Right? Before I submit this job for analysis, I still have that load applied. I can get rid of it by just crossing it out and telling it, don't worry about that load. That's no longer part of my first step. That gets rid of my loading. Now I'm going to be doing the analysis of the displacement. I'll dismiss it. At this point, I'll save the file because I'm afraid I'm going to lose all my work. I'll go back to the job and I'll create a new file. I made some notes regarding what that analysis step is, and I'm getting ready to submit it. Just wanted to let you know that this lecture is being recorded. I'll put it on YouTube so you'll have access to all of it. That little icon over there on the top tells me that it's recorded. <laughs> what happened there? Did it give me any errors? Did it give me any steps? Did it give me any increments? No, what did it tell me? It said uh, I did the analysis, I took one step, I took one increment, and I found the results. Hmm. Okay, all right. I didn't think it was that simple. So, what happened? I'd like to, monitor, I'd like to see the results in order to make up my mind. I'll switch over into the results. Okay, looks like it underwent what it needed to. This icon allows me to plot both the displaced and undisplaced shapes on top of each other. That's using this particular icon that allows multiple shape, multiple uh, allow multiple plot states. So it seems to have done what I asked it to do. I would like to see what the stress is. Hey, it's telling me that the one piece of stress is 50. I don't know what a one meter stress is. Do you know what a one meter stress is? I don't know what a one meter stress is. I know what S11 is. I know what S22 is, but I don't know what a one meter stress is. But it's trying to tell me that that's the default value it wants to give me. I say, I don't know what that means. Give me S22. It tells me that's 50 KSI2. What direction is that acting in? It tells me it's acting in a different direction. So now I want to know what the strain is. So I'll look at E. I'll look at E. Okay. 0.01 inches. Hang on. It did what I asked it to do, but it got there in one step, in one increment. So I'm very excited about this result. I want to plot the stress strain curve of any given point. Should be following the elastic plastic, right? I gave it the elastic plastic material. This is my opportunity to check whether the results will plot out the way I want it. So I'm going to say create an XY data. All right, it's going to say, what do you want me to plot? I want you to get me the ODB field, the field output. What field output? I can select just about anything. I'm going to keep the position as the integration point. I don't want the value at the centroid. I don't want the value at the node. I just want it at the integration point of the element. And what do I want? I want S22 and I want E22. So I can plot them relative to each other because I'm expecting to see the elastic, perfectly plastic stress strain curve, right? That's what I want to see. So I say, all right, plot E22. I mean, get out E22 from these results. Get out S22 from the results. It'll say, well, where do you want it? I'll pick an element from the viewport. All the elements seem to have the same behavior, so I can pick just about any element. I'll pick this one. How's that? I'll say, save that data. All right, I'll dismiss it, and I'll say, now, Combine that to show me the stress strain curve. So in order to do that, I'll go back into tools XY data create. I'll say operate on the XY data. Combine it. Combine the strain field. And 
and combine the stress view. I put a comma in between the two. And I'll say, same as x, y, data over power. Delta Okay. Let's so clear the expression. Then I'll go into the x, y data plot and I'll ask it to plot the delta. Okay. What did I get? Does that look like an elastic plastic stress strain curve? Why not? What happened to it? I feel cheated. <laughs> I was very excited about making an elastic plastic stress strain curve. So I'll say, to tell me, what, what are you plotting here? I asked you to plot the stress versus strain. Say, show me the symbols. And it will tell me that the first point was at 0, 0. The second point is at 50 and a strain of 0 0.01. What happened to the rest of the points in the <laughs> Ask I right I, as I said to you at the beginning of the class, you have to ask the right question. When you have a tool that is capable of answering many, many, many questions, you have to ask the right question in order to get the answer that you're looking for. You have to have some sense of what is it that you're looking for. I really want to see the elastic plastic stress data. It did save the data states or the results in between. It got to the analysis in one increment. It took several internal increments that it didn't tell me about because all I said was in the first step, apply a displacement of 1.8 inches. I said, all right, if I apply a displacement of 1.8 inches, that is the converged state. What do you mean by you want to know the answers in between? You asked me to give you the state at the displacement of 1.8 inches. So I said, all right, no, I'm going to change my question. I really want to get the stress strain curve. I really need to show it to my students. So I go back to the step. I go back to the step. That's where I'm going to be able to fix this. I'm going to go back to step number one. I'm going to edit it. <coughs> it says time period equal to one. That seems to be fine. But the incrementation, the initial increment size was one, and the maximum increment size was one. I'm going to fix that. I'm going to say, well, why don't you take a few more steps so that I can look at the results. When I say that the maximum increment size is 0 0.01, I'm asking it for 100 data points in between the first point and the last point. I could have asked for just 10, in which case I would give it a 0 0.1 and a 0 0.01. Should I do that? Is that a problem? Remember, it will only give me 10 points on the stress strain curve. And if this point does not fall, then it will have a stress strain curve that does that. Just so you know, that in order to capture that kink in the curve, you may or may not be able to do that. So if I go with only 10, let's see what the curve looks like. At least I'll be able to get some results out of it. So now I'm going to analyze the same problem. I want to create a new job. I'll just say, do it correctly this time so that I can look at the results in between as it gets to the state corresponding to 1% strain. And it tells me, okay, you asked me to not take steps more than 10% along the way, so it's taking a maximum time increment of 0.1. Each of those increments was 0.1, and it was done in about 10 steps, or 10 increments. Now if I go to the results, I can do the same get rid of the whole data. Create problems when I try to show it to you. Same output, E22 and S22. You can pick just about any element. Once again, I'll combine them. As you can tell, there are lots of options that are available, including filtering of data and, and so on. You can use them as you like.
Mm. It did exactly what I thought it was going to do. Does that make sense to you? It has given us 10 steps along the way. The first one is on the elastic branch. The second one is already on the inelastic branch. And you've missed that exact point where the curves. Which is all right, because I know that I gave it an elastic perfectly elastic. So important takeaways. I got it to do what I wanted it to do. Right? I gave it a displacement control increment, and it went ahead and calculated the control state. Secondly, it is doing elastic perfectly elastic behavior. That is evident from looking at the plot associated with the stress versus strain. I can further post-process the results. Also, it's not flying away in space, right? because U1 is constrained at that one node. Also, that bottom edge effect that I talked about earlier has disappeared. But in order to make it disappear, we had to have an understanding of what was going on at that bottom edge, why there was that, those hot spots associated with that. I'm con right now, I'm doing an idealized analysis, and I don't really want to see that. It may be realistic for the element that you are designing, the element that you are engineering, or the element that you are analyzing. You may have a boundary condition where both U1 and U2 are constrained. In which case, you should model it by constraining U1 and U2. Right now, I'm solving an idealized problem, so I got rid of my U1. I didn't really need any hotspots in my analysis. But that doesn't mean that having those hotspots is incorrect. It is absolutely possible that you may have a situation where the boundary condition is such that you need to provide new one of you. And if it is the case, I absolutely you should go ahead and do that. <coughs> There's my S22. It tells me a consistent value of 50. If I look at E22, that seems to be 0 0.01 or 1 raised to the 1 multiplied by 10 raised to the power minus 2. Now, I really wanted to look at the plastic strain, and I wonder where the plastic strain is located. The plastic strain is located in the variable called PE. That's the plastic strain increment, and I can look at all the components. I can look at PE11, I can look at PE22, PE12, and so on. So first I'll select PE22 and see if it makes sense to me. According to this, the, the PE22 is going to be 8. 0.27 multiplied by 10 to the power minus 3. Does that make sense to you? Can somebody on the cap let me know if that value of the plastic strain is correct? It's 0 0.01 minus 50 divided by 29,000. That's what the plastic strain increment should be. You did some of that in your homework, but that's what you're seeing as the plastic strain increment. <coughs> what about PE11? Well, it tells me that PE11 is present, and it is equal to 4 multiplied by 10 to the power minus 3. So it's about half PE22. There is plastic flow that is occurring in the 1, 1 direction as well. Of course, there is plastic flow occurring in the 2, 2 direction. What about PE12? That makes no sense. It is 10 to the power minus 16. Don't go by the contour plots. Look at the numbers. It's 10 to the power minus 17, which means that it's negligible. PE33, it refuses to show me PE33. It says, oh, it's a plain stress problem. Why do you want to look at PE33? Well, what, what do you mean by you want to look at PE33? I won't tell you the answer because it's a plain stress problem. You should know you shouldn't be looking at that. Those are some of the things that I like about Arrow because it's quite quirky. It's, it's almost like it's having a conversation with you. You ask it PE33, it says, no, I want to show you. <laughs> it doesn't exist. What do you mean? Does it exist or does it not exist? We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, of course, you can also look at the maximum principal strain. It's the same. You can look at the direction of the maximum principal strain. It's uh, in the 2-2 two -two direction. I really applied loading in one direction. You can also look at the minimum in-plane principal. That's four it's the same as S1 PE11, but the plastic strain increments also you can isolate it. Another thing you can look at, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, is PE. Another thing that you can look at is the plastic strain, the lump plastic strain, and I will introduce that topic in just a few minutes. Let me go ahead and save the file, stop recording.